This is Mike Tratum, joined today by uh, Richard Flohill, who is uh, uh, renowned for your 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 work uh, in uh, in Canada with uh, the various artists, uh, the, the history that you have, and in the, in the the music business is uh, recognized by many. Um, and it's 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 such a so, so it's, it's so nice to sit down and, and have a chat with you in this this is I sometimes think that I'm a mini micro celebrity in a very small niche of a not very big business well, <laughs> it, it's it's um but it's primarily might do with longevity not many people do this for nearly 50 years yeah, and really. at the end of 50 years if you haven't told too many fibs or out or outright lies um and if you've kind of haven't screwed up too often then you know you've got a degree of credibility although i am not convinced that uh just because you're old you're necessarily wise <laughs> <laughs> you've been um at this for so long though you've met so many people and worked with so many artists over the years um you must be taken aback even by yourself that you've met over the years. well the, there are moments and there there are memorable stories with with all of them when i when i first got into music when i was a kid i i was really passionate about um i was living in england um, a, a british the british attempts to play early American jazz. Um, and that led me to the real thing. So I discovered, you know, Duke Ellington and Louis Armstrong and all these people. And um, and from that, that led me to blues. And I became a major blues fan and, and actually was some of the impetus of emigrating to North America because I wanted to meet Muddy Waters, and I did. And I've carried his guitar, you know? Oh. and. My sort of change into the music industry as a whole came in, in 65 when I was invited to uh, host a blues workshop at something called a folk festival. I had no idea what that was, but uh, they promised to pay me $50 and I got to hang around with these blues people. I thought, cool. So that workshop was uh, Sun House, Sonny Terry, Brian McGee, a, a woman from... Uh, Detroit, uh, who had recorded with Louis Armstrong in the 20s, called Sippy Wallace. And it, at this festival that weekend, I hung around with Gordon Lightfoot, who I knew slightly before that, uh, Ian and Sylvia, um, Phil Oakes, the Staple Singers, Leonard Cohen, Buffy St. Marie. And it it was akin for me to... Isaac Newton, an apple fell on his head, and he said, "Wow, gravity!" You know, yeah. and and it was very much so. I'm evangelical about folk festivals and how they can, in a single weekend, change your life, change your musical tastes, widen them enormously. And if kids go to a festival because they know the name of the headliner, fine. So on the way to seeing the headliner, they'll find somebody they've never heard of who will blow their mind. And that's what festivals do. Name some of the artists that have had a personal impact on you over the years. That in a, Not so much a, a professional way, but in a, in a personal way. Oh, well, one of the things that I've happened... After the 60s and my very first festival, I, I became a publicist. So, uh, because I had a background in media as a journalist, as a newspaper reporter, as a magazine editor. And um, I, I, I got to meet all these people and work with some of them. And over the years, I became friends with many of them. Um, I have a, a, a typical weirdness. Um, I used to work with K.D. Lang in the very, very early days of her career when she had one independent record. And I was declared redundant the minute she got a major record contract. Mm. Uh, but one of the reasons she got a major record contract was people like me who had discovered her and heard her and talked about her and rabbited on and on and on about how good she was. Um, and... Uh, 
years later, I hadn't talked to her for 15 years, and I'm known in the business because I've never eaten vegetables. Anybody who was raised in an English boarding school in a war, and the Brits aren't very good at vegetables, but when they, you know, it was awful. And I swore when I got my first job at 16 that I would never eat another vegetable, and I haven't since. So I hadn't seen KD for maybe 15 years. And she's a huge celebrity now. And I mean, she, you know, you can't sort of pick up the phone and say, hey, Kathy, how you doing? You can't do that, you know. And we hadn't seen each other for 15 years. And I was backstage at the Winnipeg Festival a few, couple, two or three years ago. And she galloped over to me and hugged me and said, are you eating your vegetables yet? Mm. Uh, uh. <laughs> I re responded by asking her whether she'd eaten meat lately, but... <laughs> Um, so people like that, I've become, you know, friends and a little more than acquaintances of, of the current people I work with um, or have worked with recently. Um, Alejandro Ribeiro, who now lives in Montreal, has really become one of my very best friends. And I go to Montreal and I have a place to stay and, and hang out and eat decent food in strange restaurants. Um, and Shakura Saida, who is um, an elegant, charming, and amazingly smart blues singer, uh, she doesn't call me her publicist. I'm her gatekeeper. Mm. The idea is that people want stuff from Shakura, they got to go through me. And if it makes sense, I'll recommend it. If it doesn't, uh, we're missing in action. Um, but I've become friends with so many of these these artists um jada kelly melanie brule all the young people who are who are coming up and it's really weird that so many of my clients are a third or a quarter my age and and we're still friends and still work together and hang out together it's it's I've had the best life, Mike. It's just scary. I I couldn't help but notice last evening when I was at your uh, your showcase, uh, young lady putting her arms around you and saying, "I adore you." And I, I thought to myself, "What what to, to to be admired in that way by someone else is it's it's that's a that's rarely seen, you know. It really well, is." It, it, <laughs> I don't know. Years ago, um, the the three women in the Good Lovelies who I also worked with and who have become friends with, although they're now split all over the country. Um, and Jada Kelly and I, we were driving down to Folk Alliance in Memphis, and we had a long day in the car, and we checked in some motel, and we, uh, you know, the five of the four, five of us were sleeping in one room, um, and we desperately needed a drink, and we wound up in some sports bar, and we got a little um, rambunctious, and the bartender called me over, and he gestured towards the four women sitting happily swallowing gallons of drink and said how do you do that hmm. and I just well it's sort of equal measures of um, English charm and bullshit <laughs> but these people are, are my friends and I am, I'm, I'm enormously gratified by that and I think part of it is that I'm not a threat um, I might be able to or I have helped in some way whether they paid me or not you know to open a door or introduce them to somebody else or or whatever this music thing it's not what you know what you don't know you can learn easy the one thing that's most important is who you know and that's not just music, it's any trade. I used to edit magazines in the electrical contracting business, furniture retailing business. Same there. Who do you know? Mm. It's the same in every business. And after 50 years, nearly, of doing this, I won't say I know everybody, but I do know a lot of people. And if I didn't, I'd have kind of uh, failed. You uh, have... Uh a good ear. I mean, you you know when you hear someone that uh, that's yeah. a that's a talent you want to help. Uh, it, 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 what I listen for, and I think everybody in 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 
in the music business. People and most people in the music business are people who can't do music, but they're passionate about it and they want to make help make music happen. Um, I listen for a, an original voice, a, a distinctive voice. I listen for songs that um, resonate and that are memorable. And it doesn't matter whether they wrote themselves or whether they're covers of other artists who, um, as long as they're, I don't want to hear anybody else sing Mustang Sally ever again. Or Danny Boy, which is the song that just drives me right up the wall. I don't know why, it's just so schlocky. Anyway, um, so I'm listening for a distinctive voice, songs that resonate and are original I then a bunch of other factors one of them is looks this is a young person's game uh, young people have a hook the younger you are the better it also works the the other way if you're 80 as I am yeah well that that's a hook too right the guy's still alive holy wow you know um I look then for things that are different and possibly un-Canadian. Ambition. Not a trait that it sounds greedy and pushy. But if you believe in what you do and you're going for it, then you better be ambitious. You better be have a target. Um, attitude, knowledge, acquiring knowledge. How the, how the music industry works. Where does the money come from? And that's more and more problematical these days, but an awareness of the structure of the business. It, building a team around yourself, management, agent, publicist, assistant, whatever. Um, so if all of those are in place, then you have a shot. No guarantees, but you have a shot. And if I hear that, and I have another thing, Mike, this is really to appeal to me. I don't know where I came up with this. Music for me has to appeal to any two of the following parts of the human body. The brain, the heart, the groin, the feet. Any two of those, and I'm interested. If it's just, if it's just one, I'm, I, it doesn't get me. If it's all brain, if it's all sloshy, hot, sentimental heart, if it's all dance, 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 and nothing else. But if any combination of those things can, can trigger it, you know? Isn't that something? Isn't that something? That's, that's an interesting <laughs> observation, that's for sure. What's your um, relationship with the media been like over the years, the press? That, well, uh, because I'm a former newspaper reporter, because I've edited magazines I've, um, uh, in the music field, I edited a magazine for CAPAC, one of the two organizations that became SOCAN, I edited that magazine called The Canadian Composer for 20 years. I uh, co-founded a trade magazine called The Record, which I ran for 17 years. I was editor of a magazine promoting Canadian music abroad called Applaud for five years before it collapsed. Um, because of all that media experience, I know that a certain amount of hype and BS is part of a publicist's business. You can never, ever tell a lie. If you do, it's like being caught with your pants around your ankles. Nobody will ever believe you again. So if you say, the Down Child Blues Band is the greatest group in Canada since the Beatles, that's bullshit. Nobody with any sense at all would believe that. If you say, this is a really good blues band that you ought to go and hear and they've really got something going for them, oh, and you didn't lie to those people before, they'll say, okay, and they'll go. And that will be true. They will find this is a pretty good damn book band. Um, I, I'm, I'm just thinking of, of artists, artists from <laughs> West, <laughs> Uh, sorry, artists from Down East. I remember I first met Stomping Tom Connors in 
1970. He just started playing in Toronto. He'd had his sort of first breakthrough. I remember seeing him at the Horseshoe Tavern. He had this huge boat of a car. God knows what it was, a Chevy or something. There are things that look long and wide and flat and silly. And he had a trailer behind it, a red trailer hitched to the back. And I, so I'm remembering, I think it said, Stomp and Tom Connors, the pride of North Ontario, or something like that. And I, pres I promoted um, Tom's very first concert at Massey Hall. And we sold it out. And I, I knew Tom in various things. And what a character. In, in this book I'm slowly writing, there's a chapter about Stomping Tom that is not altogether flattering. If you're the Stomping Tom can do no harm, you know, do nothing but good, let me tell you this was a pretty flawed character in many ways. Um, I, I love the... I love the fact that when he passed away, the media says, Stomping Tom Connors died today of natural causes. Well, if two and a half packs of cigarettes and 12 moose head a day are natural causes, fine. <laughs> That's what he died yeah, of. Right. Um, but what a character. I remember being in oh, the East Coast Music Awards in Charlottetown and myself and Laura Smith. Laura is a, an artist who now lives in in, in the Maritimes, and, and it's associated, I think, in the Maritimes, although she's originally from London, Ontario. Um, Laura and I worked together for a long while, and we're still the dearest of friends. I just love that woman. I love her heart and her character and her songs and everything about her. And we are up in Stump and Tom Suite in some big fancy hotel in Charlottetown. I think there's only one big fancy hotel in Charlottetown. I don't really remember. And Tom has invited us up there to drink his potato moonshine, mm. which was in unmarked bottles in in the bath, in the bathroom. And that was the most lethal stuff I have ever drunk, and I've drunk a fair bit of stuff in you know, however long I've been drinking. That was lethal. The first, the first taste anesthetizes your throat. After that, you can drink as much as you like until you fall over. But you won't taste anything. <laughs> Funny guy. You've got all kinds of stories. I can, I can just imagine the stories. You, you, to, to, but to uh, sum up, um, um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to have the opportunity just to speak to you today oh, and, cool. and, and re relate some of those stories. So. Well, I just wish I'd spent... I wish I had spent more time in Atlantic Canada for a number of reasons. First of all, every time I've been there, it's been an absolute blast. Oh, the very first time I went to St. John's, Newfoundland, I wound up with a, with a Newfoundlander called Brooks Diamond, who's oh, still a friend all these years. Yeah. And he took, I, you may have to edit this right out, but we'll do it. He took me into a bar in St. John's called, I think it was called the Commander's Quarters or something like that. It was right behind the big hotel. And I walked in and uh, Brooks knew the place and said, this is my friend. And the bartender says, CFA? Excuse me? CFA? Come from away? Oh, right, yes. Okay. Um, so where are you from by? I said, oh, Toronto. He said, oh, I'm so sorry. A free Guinness for this man, please. <laughs> and then he got sort of intimate. He said, you know, this used to be the best whorehouse in St. John's. And I looked around and this red flock wallpaper and giant gilt mirrors and wide entrances between various... And I thought, yeah, this... this <laughs> <laughs> Could have been. <laughs> and at the very end, the bartender calls me over. He says, we're calling time, but don't go. So he called time and he rang a little bell and maybe the 60, 70 people in the bar, 12 left. They locked the doors and the Kaylee started. And I have never, I am not a huge fan of, you know, traditional Celtic Irish music. I don't, I don't mind it, I, you know. But that uh, that night, 
when everybody cleared out of the bar and the music started, a circle of a dozen fiddle players, a boron or two, a couple of guitars, and I stood at the edge of that circle of players and I was so moved by what I heard and the, the teamwork and all the rest, and people like Ashley McIsaac and so many people from from that part of this country have become friends and, and acquaintances and I, I never realized until this last summer how brilliant Ashley McIsaac is. Mm. And I was emceeing um, a, a fiddle thing and I'm standing next to him and just watching while he plays. The guy is amazing. He He's a lot less crazy than he used to be, but damn it, he's an amazing, amazing artist. I love the guy to get to death. Amazing. Thank you, Richard Flohill. My pleasure. No.